Alors, allons-y, on y va, motore. What do you say? Tourner. Ça tourne. Ça tourne. Ça tourne. Action. 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 Avec une nouvelle action. Action. Mr. James Cameron, thank you for having us here. You know, hey, it's really thank you. Great to have you on the exhibition finally. You know. I know, we've been talking for years and now uh, here we are. Yeah, exactly. So, actually, uh, the very first question is simple. The basis of the exhibition is techno art. You know the book about your uh, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. work, you know, as a designer, as an artist, you know. And uh, we were wondering where, uh, when did you coined that term, you know, at the time of Terminator, you know, and what does it mean for you? So, techno art was the name of the, the nightclub in the Terminator. Everything was moving very fast on that film, but at a certain point when I was starting to design, I was thinking, all right, what's the style? What's the photographic style? And um, I was talking to the DP, uh, Adam Greenberg, and I said, it, it's like noir, right? A little bit of German expressionism, but, but sort of noir, very, you know, chiaroscuro, you know, strong light and shadow. And I said, but, but it's got to have a, a tech feel to it, something cold, something in the way we light the steel, you know, the steel in his face, the steel in the factory. So we do some blue light, we do some strong blue backlight. I said, so it's like a, like a tech noir. And I went, ooh, I like that because the, the name of the nightclub was called Stokers in the, in the script. And I said, I'm going to call it tech noir. So we had the, the neon made for that, very much like the one they've reproduced over here. And it's like, okay, that's it. But it became like a, a genre. It, yeah, it, yeah, sure, I think so. Yeah, for instance, would you say that uh, Strange Days uh, would be a, a techno movie? Yeah. Uh, even more so, uh -huh. I think, because Strange Days was very much more of a human story. There was no extraordinary technology except for the squid device, obviously. There was no machine man, no cyborgs, nothing extraordinary like that. So I would say that that's a very noir story with the betrayals and nothing exactly as it seems to be and a kind of mystery at its heart. I'd say Strange Days is more tech noir than Terminator actually is. There's a, there's a great story, I mean, uh, with the Piranha 2 poster, you know, which is for us, it's very iconic because in a B movie kind of way, you know, which we like, we love with that, you know. Yeah. But we were wondering one thing, you know, this is a movie where you were fired at the time, you know. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And I only, I only directed about five days mm -hmm. of the film and I tried to get my name taken off the film, but I couldn't afford a lawyer. <laughs> it was a nightmare. But, but you still had to, to paint the, 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 the movie poster, which is well, yeah, way better than the movie. <laughs> I was you know, working for the releasing company. Uh, it was called Saturn Releasing. It was kind of funny. So there was a building and it was divided down the middle and it had two doors. On one side, it was Saturn Releasing and they did these super low budget films and most of them went straight to video. And this was in the early days of mail order video, right? And then the other door was a place called Caballero Films, which was straight porn, <laughs> com com complete porn. And it was, that, that's where they made all their money, which was mail order VHS, right? And so, you know, they'd take me over to the Caballero side. There was just a door, you know, <laughs> and, and I saw this warehouse with, you know, tens of thousands of VHS tapes in, in plain brown envelopes, you know? I thought, and I, so, I, so I used to laugh at these guys. They had gold chains and stuff. They were like, they were like porn gangsters, right? But they loved me because every time I did a painting for one of their piece of shit films, they'd make some money. You know? Did you have to see the movie? No, Before they, they'd no. give me the tape. I'd watch two minutes. It was so bad. <laughs> I'd throw it away and I'd just make something up that had nothing to do with the film. And it, the first time I did that, I thought they were going to yell at me. And they said, oh, this is great. We can sell a lot of tapes with this. They didn't care. It was just, you know, they were just moving product. But wasn't it difficult to do the, the poster for Piranha 2? Uh, since... Look, I had an uneasy relationship with that film because... When you're just starting out, uh -huh. any credit is better than no credit, yeah. right? And so I was being very kind of Machiavellian. I was just going for a result. And the result was, if I could say I directed a movie, I could get another movie, right? The truth is, I didn't direct the film. I directed five days of a 27-day shoot. Mm -hmm. And basically, 
you know, put quite simply, anything that was any good in that film I directed and everything else, everything that was bad, the other guy directed. But he, he set me up. He wanted to fire me when he hired me. Really? Oh, okay. absolutely. He had, he had done it twice before. And it went like this. He had a deal with Warner Brothers that was a negative pickup. So he spent the front end money. They guaranteed, you know, that they would buy the film. But one of their rules was it had to be an American director. Because he, he was actually an Egyptian guy who had grown up in Rome, and he had a very kind of florid kind of Italian sensibility, but gone wrong. Not, <laughs> not, not good like Dario Argento, you know I mean? <laughs> but gone wrong. And so they, um, they required an American director, so he'd hire somebody, he'd let them shoot three or four days, and then he'd fire them so that he could take over, and then he'd do all the scenes with the young starlets with their tops off. That's kind of how it worked. And I didn't see it coming, I had no idea, and I didn't know the history that he had done it twice before. He was like a serial killer, and I was the next guy getting pulled into the van, you know what I mean? And, uh, and then, lo and behold, I got fired after a few days, and I hadn't even seen any of the footage. He would go to New York and view the footage and say, it doesn't work, nothing cuts, uh, it's going to be terrible, and you got to go, right? And I went, oh, geez, I thought I was, I thought I was kind of doing okay, you know. And so then I had to answer the question for myself: Was it really bad? Because if it was bad, if my stuff was bad, then I needed to stop. But I didn't think it was. I invited myself to the cutting room in Rome so I could get in and look at my footage. And what I found was they had cut it all wrong. They had cut it all out of order. I was trying to build suspense, and there was a side of a certain architecture in mind. So I showed them how to recut it, right? So at that point, they kind of wanted me back because I could maybe make the film a little better. But the producer didn't want me back. So then it was like, okay, crap, whatever. And then they asked me if I'd if I'd do the artwork for it. It's like, which is crazy, really. Uh, you know, but at least I would, I'd get paid something, <laughs> right? You know, I think I got paid more for that painting than I got paid to direct the movie. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> you, you worked with uh, Moebius, Jean Giraud on uh, The Abyss. Sure. And uh, Jean Giraud said that uh, for him, painting and drawing was like a, a, a waking dream, like uh, self-hypnosis. Yeah. Yeah. And we know, we all know that some of your ideas come from dreams. Sure. So would you say that drawing for you and painting was like a bridge between your dreams and doing Ab the movie? Absolutely. I couldn't have put it better. In fact, I'm going to use that. <laughs> You've got this, I call it a, a storytelling engine that's in your brain. So part of your brain is putting on a show for, part of, for another part of your brain. So there's a part of your mind that's essentially the receiver, the, the ego locus, if you will, that's watching. But other parts of you are putting on a show, right? Assembling little narrative bits together and firing off each other, and then images emerge. It's very much like generative AI in the sense that, that generative AI scrapes from massive data sets. So we scrape in our dreams from massive data sets. Everything we've ever seen, everything we've ever experienced, everything we've ever read, it's all going into this massive data set. And then the dream process is a prompt. Like, and sometimes one bead on that string will be the prompt for the next bead and the next bead. And you never know where it's going because it's just a series of, of prompts. And then something coalesces very much like these diffusion models into an image, a little bit of a story. Characters suddenly appear in a landscape, in a place, and there's no real logic to it because you don't know what's going to happen next. It's just a long series of, of prompts, but it has some kind of internal logic to it in the moment, right? We all feel present in a dream. I'm there. I'm experiencing something. It's in POV. You're not seeing yourself from the outside, usually, I think most people don't, right? So it's a POV experience. That means it's, it's being scraped from everything you've ever experienced. I think dreams and gen AI and drawing are all part of the same aspect of consciousness. You know, so something occurs to you in a dream, you draw it. Now that drawing becomes a prompt for the next drawing and the next drawing and the next drawing. It's the same thing when you're writing a script. 
you don't always know what the character is going to do next. When I think at first it's very analytical and you're using structural ideas and that there's a certain point where the characters just start to have life. They become organisms in your, in your mind. Uh, I'm fascinated by all this and I actually think that the study of AI is going to draw out from us a better understanding of our own consciousness and our own creative process. There's one thing that's very striking when you watch your art, you know, and specifically your Uh, the first art, you know, when you were younger, you know, yeah. which is, uh, it's very uh, cinematographic, you know, yeah. and uh, there are comic books, you know, that you draw from, yeah. you know, and yeah. we were wondering if it was a, a way of, for you, you know, to tell a story visually, you know, narratively with, yeah. uh, with the image. Like uh, yeah. ground for, for. I always, I had a harder time writing than drawing. Mm. Writing was a second, more of a learned art form. Mm -hmm. Drawing came naturally. So, I would draw stories, and then I'd start to supply the text, and then it gets complicated. Oh, now I have to name the characters. Now I have to describe what's happening. So the drawings came first, and even to this day, I like to get some art done first before I start writing, so I know what the characters look like. You know, it's like I'm forming the ideas visually first, and then I'll apply a, a kind of narrative discipline to it uh, afterwards. That's part of my writing process. I even brought that into the writing room on the Avatar sequels. I had a number of other writers working with me to help break the story from end to end across all the sequels. And I would go up to the art department and I'd bring down you know, some of their big prints and I'd just start sticking them up around the, around the writing office to inspire the other writers. I don't think they relied on it as much as I did, but they all said that it was very helpful for them. But how do you use uh, storyboards, for instance? Because storyboards can be a screenplay, but in a drawing form, we know that, for instance, uh, Akira Kurosawa or uh, Terry Gilliam, for instance, they drew their, their storyboards. It's, it's like a new draft of a screenplay, in a yeah, sense. Yeah. Do you use storyboards in that way, for instance? Because there are some thumbnails, uh, storyboards from Aliens, for instance, in, in Technoir in the book. So you can see that the storyboards on the Terminator are yeah. very, very finite and very precise. And you can see that the shots that were derived from those storyboards are very, very similar. So I was thinking more in a sequence of almost fixed images. Okay. You know, Now, the camera might be moving, but the relationship between the camera and the car probably didn't change very much as it moved through space, right? And obviously all the, the, the stuff with the surgery and everything, it was all worked out ahead of time. So to me, I was using storyboarding to imagine my my angles, my frame, to imagine how we'd physically accomplish some of the, the effects, right? I also had time to prepare that movie in a way that I've never prepared any other movie after that. And you can see the storyboards for Aliens are very rough. They, they might be something that I would do at breakfast or the night before, you know, a quick sketch of, of how I was going to compose the sequence inside Narcissus when they find her. And you can see the gloved hand wiping away the, the, the ice crystals. You can see the frame when the, when the laser cutter comes into the room and all that. But you have to really use your imagination. You know? So there are storyboards I, do, I did on Terminator for other people mm -hmm. where I wanted clarity. Yeah. Took longer. Yeah. And then there are storyboards I do for myself, which are very thumbnail, mm -hmm. right? but they mean something to me. And then now we don't do, I don't do storyboards at all, really? at all. You don't need that. No, what we do is con concept art and we go from concept art to 3D models of the environments. I have uh, my acting troupe, which is not my principal cast, it's my troupe okay. of um, versatile players who can play any one of the characters because we can dress them in any body and any face we want. And then we just start working the scene. Mm -hmm. So now I start to use the, the virtual camera. I say, okay, I want that shot, I want that shot, I want a close-up, I want this, I want that. We kind of skip the storyboarding and we go straight to a form of previs. And it's a previs that I do. It's not a keyframe previs. Most people do keyframe previs, but I don't like that because that's somebody else making up a shot for me versus me organically working in the scene. I can tell the actors where to go, what to do. I can be low, I can be high, I can be wide. And so we just get a bunch of images 
And then I select from those images and I start to put the scene together in, in my mind. And then that's it. We don't draw it up. We don't formalize it. It's the next step is to get the actors mm -hmm. and actually start to, to do the scene. So storyboarding has kind of fallen by the wayside. I mean, every once in a while I might do little thumbnails for myself, especially during live action. So the morning of a scene, of the shooting of a scene, I may quickly sketch up what I want and number the, number the setups or something like that. But it's really more of a, uh, just a quiet uh, meditation on the kind of coverage that I want. Before you're under the gun on yeah, the set. Yeah, when you're on the set, you don't have time to, hmm, you know what would be cool, guys? You know, <laughs> you, you can do that in virtual production. You can't do that in live action production. You're working now with uh, uh, many uh, talented artists like yeah. uh, Neville Page and, and Cole. Dylan, and so Dylan Cole and, yeah, yeah. and, and Ben and, Proctor. And, and, and they all work with computer. Yeah. And you're still working with paper and pencil <laughs> yeah uh, isn't I'm, that amazing i'm the dinosaur i don't i don't i don't draw in photoshop at all mm -hmm. i mean i know why they do it because they're doing it as a means to an end mm -hmm. not an end in itself right and if i ask them for changes they can go back they can remove layers they can change the lighting they can they, they treat it like a composite mm -hmm. you know like a like a vfx almost and that's very good that works very well for us and And that's why they all work in that way. But when they work for themselves, they paint. Ah, okay. When they work for themselves, like when they do something that's just for their pleasure, they paint. James Cameron, thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you so for your much. time. All right. Thank, thank you for talking about, right? Yeah, yeah, sure. We have to. Okay, cool. <laughs>